Welcome to the GCSE history video student walkthrough in collaboration with Harris Federation. This is the second part of a paper three modern depth study video and in this one we're going to focus on section B. My name is Casey Matthews, I'm the deputy history lead for the Harris Federation and I work with students across London and Essex preparing them for their GCSEs. I'm Ben Armstrong, I'm a subject specialist working with Pearson at Excel and I specialise in GCSE history. So what are we going to cover in this video? We're going to focus primarily on the questions in section B, that is the question three package. And then at the end of the video, we're going to give you some suggestions to help you revise in preparation for your exam. So what do the questions look like for the modern depth study? Well, section B is the second part of paper three. You might have already watched the other video which covered section A. The overall paper is one hour, 20 minutes with 52 marks. Section A was worth 16 marks, so about a third of the time on the exam. We're focusing now on section B, which has 32 marks with four marks for spelling, punctuation and grammar. And what that means in practical terms is it's worth about two thirds of the marks in this paper. And so when you're dividing your time up, you really need to spend about two thirds of your time on this section of the paper or about 55 minutes. What do the questions look like? Well, you're going to see four questions in section B and they're labelled as 3A, 3B, 3C and 3D. 3A is rather similar to a question you've already seen on paper one. It's asking you to evaluate two sources, sources B and C. That's worth eight marks, so it needs about 15 minutes or 19 if you've got extra time. Then question 3B looks at two interpretations and it asks you to identify the main difference in the views. Question 3C is why those interpretations differ. It'll ask you for one reason why the two interpretations have a different viewpoint. Now each of questions 3B and 3C is worth four marks and that means that they both need about the same amount of time. Ideally that should probably be about five minutes or six minutes if you've got extra time. The last question, 3D, is the one that needs the lion's share of the time. This one is asking you how far you agree with the interpretation too. It's asking you to evaluate the viewpoint and reach a judgment. We say it needs the majority of the time because it's worth 16 marks with an extra four for spelling, punctuation and grammar, meaning that there's 20 marks in total available on this question. For that reason, you need to make sure you leave a decent amount of time. We recommend that about 30 minutes is ideal, or 38 if you're working with extra time. Before we go into looking at the questions individually, we just want to identify one really important point that you need to understand. You might have noticed that instead of being questions three, four, five, and six, they're 3A to 3D. And that's because really, you need to see them as a package. They're not separate questions. All four of the parts will be on the same topic. It'll have the same inquiry focus. And as you work your way from 3A to 3D, what you're really doing is you're thinking as a historian. You're showing the sorts of skills that a historian would have to use as they carry out their work in research in a particular topic. So keep that in mind as we start to go through the questions because we're going to look at each one one at a time, it would be very easy to treat them as separate, but they really are part of the same question inquiry. So Katie, could you start us off by talking about 3A, please? Of course, let's start with the first part of the question three package then, source utility. So what do we mean by a source? Well, sources are pieces of evidence which are contemporary to the period in which you study. They might be written or they might be visual. And there are some different examples here. So if, for example, you were studying the Russia uh, paper three option, you might get something like a Soviet poster. If, for example, you were doing the American unit, you might get a photograph from that period. 
but ultimately sources tend to record the experiences of those directly involved. In the exam paper, you can have one image and one written source, or you can have two written sources. So it's worth uh, practicing with both. It's important to bear in mind that no single source ever gives us a complete picture about the past, which is why you were asked to look at two sources as part of this question. So you have to look at source B and source C, and this is getting you to work as close to being a historian as possible. So let's have a look at the question. Take, for example, this one here from the Weimar and Nazi Germany unit. How useful are sources B and C for an inquiry into Nazi policies towards women? So we've touched already on the STEM, how useful. So it's saying how useful is the source or how helpful is it for a historian who wants to learn about a topic? So if, for example, I was a historian and I wanted to learn about Nazi policies towards women, what I would do first is go look for some sources and see what evidence I can get from them. The example would have given you the two sources here, source B and source C. So make sure that you use both of them. The topic or the focus of the inquiry is really important. And as Ben said, that will be the same inquiry throughout the question of this package. The examiner even reminds you what you need to do. So don't forget to read those tips. They tell you that you need to use the sources and your own knowledge of the hi historical context. Let's take a look at the mark scheme and see what the examiner is looking for. You can see here I've colour coded the different sections. You might want to pause the video and have a quick read through. The first bit we're looking for is a judgment. So for you to decide how useful the sources are for the inquiry that has been given. We're looking for your development and understanding around the provenance. We're looking for your use of the source's content. And we're looking for your application of contextual knowledge for the focus of the inquiry. To summarise that then, we're looking at the content. What does the source tell you about the inquiry topic? We're looking at the provenance. What does the nature, so that means the type of source, the origin, where it's from, or the purpose, why it was made, makes it more or less useful. And then we're looking for your contextual knowledge. Does your knowledge of Weimar and Nazi Germany support or challenge the source? Is it accurate? Is it representative? And these are the three strands that we'll be looking at when we're marking it in addition to making an overall judgment. So let's have a look at one of the sources then. As I said, the question is, how useful are the sources B and C for an inquiry into Nazi policies towards women? Pause the video here and have a look at source C whilst reading the provenance of the source, which is that small bit of text just above that tells you about the origin. So what could a student say about this source? Let's have a look at an exemplar answer. This one here is a weak level three answer. Pause the video here and see where the student is trying to hit each of the different parts of the mark scheme. So looking at content of the source, the use of provenance and their own contextual knowledge. We can see here in this answer, I've identified where the student is meeting the different areas of the mark scheme. So they opened their answer by making a clear judgment. Source C is partially useful, so they are making that judgment at the beginning. They then go on to use some of the content of the photograph. So they are saying women, uh, the source shows that women are carrying out skilled labour jobs at an industrial level. Where the student's response is a little bit weaker is looking at the provenance of the source. So 
that says it is taken by an unknown photographer. So we don't know their opinion as the photograph is also unreliable as it is not place specific and is may not be representative of all of Germany. And that's quite a generalized comment to make. Therefore, this answer is a weak level three. Bearing in mind, though, that you would also need to evaluate source B as well, and this is only part of the answer. So let's have a look at a stronger answer for this question. You may wish to pause the video here and particularly focus on the students' discussion around the provenance of the source to see where it is stronger. Again, I have highlighted on this student's answer where they are meeting the different parts of the mark scheme. They begin by saying source C is useful, so they have made a judgment. And importantly, they also make reference to that at the end of their evaluation of the sources as well, that you can see that I've highlighted in bold. They're consistently focused on the question, so Nazi policies towards women, so they know what the inquiry is that they are being asked to do. And here they've identified correctly that the source provenance is from 1938 and they make the statement that the purpose of this source is to portray women hard at work. This student overall gets a level three for this answer. Of course, again, they've also done source B, and so this is only part of the answer. Let's move on to look at question 3B on how the interpretations differ. Ben, over to you. So from question 3B onwards, we're now talking about interpretations, not sources. And it's really important to make sure that you're clear on the difference in interpretations and sources, they're not the same thing. So what is an interpretation? Well, an interpretation is the judgment that historians have made when they've researched a topic. They've looked at the historical sources that they've studied and they've made conclusions about the topic. For example, they might decide that something was good or bad. They might decide that one factor was more important than another factor. They might decide that something was successful or unsuccessful. It's an opinion that that historian has reached. So interpretations are not the same as sources and interpretation is not historical evidence. They are just opinions that a historian has formed by carrying out research. They'll have spent time looking at many historical sources and the sources that they've looked at will have affected the conclusions that they've reached about the past. So question 3B is asking you to identify the difference between the two views. It says study interpretations one and two. They give different views about Nazi policies towards women. So the question is asking you to compare interpretation one with interpretation two. Uh, just a key point to notice, and it's something Katie already mentioned, can you see the inquiry focus? It says different views about Nazi policies towards women. That will always be the same inquiry as you've just written about in 3A. It asks you for the main difference. In other words, what do the two historians disagree about? And then there's a helpful little suggestion at the end. It says using details from both interpretations. In order to get a stronger mark, you're going to need to refer to a detail from each interpretation to support your answer. So here's the two interpretations. These are from a past paper. We have interpretation one, which is from a book called Weimar and Nazi Germany. We have interpretation two, which is taken from the history learning site. You might want to pause the video to take a moment to read through these and to try and identify what each of the historians has concluded about Nazi policies towards women. One useful thing to do with the interpretations to help you identify them is to highlight key points. 
Now that's useful in two ways. Firstly, if you highlight some of the key language, it can help you to identify what the historian was getting at. But also, and we'll come back to this later, but in question 3D, you need to be ready to analyze and decide whether you agree with interpretation two. So having some useful quotes already highlighted when you answer 3B means you can come back to them and use them in 3D. So look at what I've highlighted in interpretation one. The historian talks about the policies and he says they're not particularly successful. Further down, he says more women returning to work. Well, if you have any contextual knowledge, you'll know that the Nazis were trying to get women out of work. So that would support the idea of not being successful. It talks about them having a cautious approach and saying few women were actually forced out of jobs. So we can pick out from those key little quotes that this historian is saying that the Nazi policies were not very successful because women were continuing to work. What about the second one? Well, we've got a key quote there. Hitler was very clear. And then it says women were not expected to work. And then it talks about female doctors and civil servants who were sacked. So this is giving us a contrasting view. Interpretation two is telling us that the Nazis were very quick to act and that women didn't work. There seems to be a direct conflict in what these two historians have concluded about the Nazi policies towards women. So let's see what that might look like in an answer. Here we have a slightly weaker answer. This one received half marks, two out of four. Pause it for a moment to read this answer. Remember that the question is asking for a main difference between them. It says interpretation one suggests that women are returning to work. However, in interpretation two, one main view is that women should bring up children at home whilst their husbands worked. The main difference is between the views of work. Well, this student has correctly identified a difference. So what's missing? Why doesn't it get full marks? Well, it hasn't supported the answer by using a reference to each of the interpretations. Let's see a stronger example, which gets full marks by referring to both interpretations. You might notice before you've even read it that even though I said this is a full mark answer, it's not a lot longer than the one we just saw. It's still a relatively short answer. But look what this one does. It says interpretation one suggests that the Nazi policies towards women working were unsuccessful. And we've got a quote here that the number of women in all types of jobs increased. However, on the other hand, interpretation two states that the Nazi policies towards women's employment were very successful. And another quote, many female doctors and civil servants were sacked. So this answer has identified a key difference in the interpretations, but it's also supported them by making a reference to each of the interpretations. And the best way to do it is with a short, simple quote, just like this one has done. So this is an example where you can get four out of four without having to write a very long answer. The next question then takes this process a step further. Remember, you've just identified how they're different. This question asks us, why are they different? So the question will say, suggest one reason. So only need one reason. There's no extra marks for thinking of more than one reason. Why interpretations one and two give different views about Nazi policies towards women? So all we need is a valid supported reason why these historians have reached different conclusions. Now, the question gives us a bit of a hint as to one way you might want to answer it, because it says underlined in grey, you may use sources B and C to help explain your answer. And this is one way to approach it. Katie, since you already talked to us about sources B and C and the utility question, perhaps you could explain how students could approach that. 
Absolutely. So this is one way of thinking about it. If we step away from a history example and think about um, school. So we'll go with a scenario. Take student Beth and student Charlie and they've had a disagreement. OK, now in school, as most of you would know, if there's a disagreement between two students, what your teachers normally get you to do is write a statement. So in this scenario, Beth writes her statement about what has happened and the disagreement. And Charlie writes his statement about the disagreement and what has happened. So if we were to think logically about this, who would Beth blame in her statement? She would blame student Charlie. Charlie in his statement would blame Beth for the disagreement. And so if we think of those as our two separate sources, so source B is from Beth and source C is from Charlie. Now, if we were to take two teachers, teacher one reads Beth's statement and teacher two reads Charlie's statement. Now, teacher one reading Beth's statement, well, who are they going to think is to blame for the disagreement? Of course, they're going to blame Charlie because the source has been written by student Beth. Teacher two, if they were to read Charlie's statement, would blame Beth on the other hand, because as we know, this source or this statement has been written by student Charlie. So we know that the two sources or two statements have different viewpoints. Teacher one and teacher two are therefore then forming different opinions about the disagreement because they are using different pieces of evidence. They are looking at different statements of events. If, for example, then the head teacher was to try and work out what had happened and what the disagreement was, they would potentially talk to teacher one who would give their viewpoint that ultimately it might have been Charlie's fault for the disagreement. And teacher two, who says that it could have been Beth's fault for the disagreement. And the job as the head teacher is to work out, well, what actually happened and who do you agree with? So if we were to step back into our history exam shoes, that head teacher, ultimately that role is you. You're looking at two different interpretations. You're looking, say, at the two teachers and their viewpoints, what they think has happened based on the evidence they've read. And the evidence they've read or potentially looked at could be the two sources in this situation. So interpretation one might have looked at evidence that they found in source B, whereas interpretation two might have looked at the evidence from source C. So that's one way that you can potentially use the sources to help you work out why these two interpretations, these two different historians could potentially have differing views about the same topic. Is that useful, Ben? That's a really nice way of putting it. Thank you very much. So that hint in the question then, you may use sources B and C, Students could do that to match up the sources and show how one has supported each interpretation. But it is good to know as well, that's just one way of answering it. So did they use different sources? Did those historians use a source like B or C? But other ways of thinking about the question could be, did they focus on different aspects of the topic? Are they really talking about the same kind of thing? Are they focused on different areas of history? For example, is one more political, whereas the other's more social or economic, which means to do with money and trade and things like that. Are they focused on different aspects of society and history? Or are they looking at different groups of people? Or are they looking at different timescales? Is one talking about events slightly earlier or slightly later than the other? The point we're making here is that there are different ways of answering this question. You need to decide one that makes sense and explain it in your answer. 
Let's take a look at two examples, and both of these are strong full mark examples. So the first one is a student who decided to answer the question using the sources, like Katie just explained. So let's see how they've done it. You might want to pause the video so you can read it, but in particular, as you're reading it, pay attention to how they have linked the sources and interpretations. So they've started by saying interpretations may differ due to historians giving weight to different sources. That's true. But the important thing is that they've not stopped there. They've then showed how the sources link to the interpretations. They've linked interpretation one with source C and they've linked interpretation two with source B. But it's very important to know it's not enough just to link them and match them together. They've also pulled out a reference by quoting or mentioning a detail from the interpretation that links to the source. So they've quoted from interpretation one and then they've picked a detail from source C that matches it. And then they've referred to interpretation two with a quote and they've matched it with a quote from source B. Because they've given a valid reason and they've supported it by using the sources and interpretations, this gets four marks. A different way of getting four marks is to use one of the other ways of explaining that we mentioned a moment ago. So you'll see in this example, the student hasn't mentioned the sources. They said one reason is that the historians are focused on different areas of the topic. Interpretation one has focused on the Nazi economic policy. So it talks more about the need for workers, which led to more women returning to work. In contrast, so that's some good language. In contrast, interpretation B has focused on the Nazi ideology for women. So it focuses on what they wanted to happen, saying that women were not expected to work. So this is a different way of answering the question, but it's just as valid as using the sources. They've identified that the two interpretations are focused on different areas of the question. One is about what the Nazis wanted to happen. One is about what the Nazis had to do because of economic issues. And so they've used that to justify the answer. So now we've answered 3B and 3C. We've said how are the interpretations different? And we've said, why are the interpretations different? That leads us nicely into 3D, our longer 16 mark question. Remember, we've said that this is part of a package. So if you've worked your way through from 3A towards 3D, you should already be focused on the inquiry topic. You've already answered three questions about the inquiry. So your mind should be full of the types of knowledge that you've revised very carefully and you should have a clear understanding of what the two viewpoints are in the interpretations. The beginning of the question reminds you that there are extra marks for spelling, punctuation, grammar and specialist terminology. So there's four marks you can pick up because of the careful way you write this answer. Then the question says, how far do you agree with interpretation two? It will always be about interpretation two. So it's asking you not for your opinion on the topic of Nazi policies towards women. It's asking you essentially, do you think the historian who wrote interpretation two got it right? How far do you agree with them? Have they presented a viewpoint that you think is valid based on what you've learned? Now, underlined in gray is a quite important instruction. And if you ignore this, it will affect <clears throat> your overall mark. It says using both interpretations and your knowledge of the historical context. So you are going to have to refer to both interpretations and you are going to have to use some of your own knowledge. I think it's worth also adding on this question, Ben, that some students get quite intimidated by this one. Um, but just to reassure students that you've already done a lot of the heavy lifting and the hard work through the rest of the questions on um, question three as well. That's absolutely true. Yeah, thanks, Katie. So what is an examiner looking for? Well, the examiner is looking for answers which make explained evaluation 
So evaluating both of the interpretations. It's looking for answers that analyze the interpretations or explain what's in them and showing how the difference of view has been conveyed. Remember, you already know what the difference of view is and you've already hopefully highlighted some key quotes in question 3B. So when you go back to them, you can use those highlighted quotes. The examiner's looking for you to use some relevant contextual knowledge. But remember, this isn't a question all about your knowledge. It's a question about whether your knowledge agrees or disagrees with the historian in interpretation too. And it's looking for a line of reasoning which reaches what the examiner calls a substantiated judgment. That just means a supported judgment. So when you get to the end and you make your overall decision about how far you agree with interpretation two, it needs to be supported by what you've said in the answer. So it's been mentioned, but it's so important. A common mistake on this question is for students to think that this is about asking your opinion on the question. And then they might choose to write an essay all about the topic and ignore the interpretations. Remember, this is not a knowledge question. This is a question about using your knowledge to decide how far you agree with the historian interpretation too. And that needs to be your focus all the way through this answer. So our question was, how far do you agree with interpretation two about Nazi policies towards women? We'll take a look at a couple of parts of this answer. This is just one paragraph. So you might want to pause the video here and read this paragraph. So let's pick out some key points. We've got red for looking about how they've analysed and evaluated the interpretation and blue is knowledge. So the first thing you should notice is there's more red than blue. This question is about analysing and evaluating the interpretation and the knowledge is only there to support the evaluation. So it's not about putting in lots of knowledge, it's about how you use the knowledge in your answer. So they've started off quite strongly. One could agree with interpretation two's perspective. And then they've pulled out a quote. The writer states that 800,000 couples accepted loans. So they've made a reference to what the extract is saying. And then they explain what that is. They use some own knowledge to explain that this was the loans offered to newly married couples if the wife left her job. And it demonstrates that many women in Germany did follow the Nazis policies. So they're using knowledge here to agree with the interpretation. The knowledge isn't just put in to show what they know. And that leads them to a conclusion within this paragraph. It says, therefore, one could agree with interpretation too, as the Nazis did succeed in persuading some women to leave their jobs. So they've written analytically and evaluated whether or not they agree with the content by using some contextual knowledge. There's also a really lovely focus on the question in that paragraph as well. They keep yes. coming back to the Nazi policies towards the women. So really good. Yes, very focused, isn't it? So let's see another part of the same answer. Now, just before we uh, ask you to read it, and again, in a moment, you might want to pause it. Here we can see where they've made reference to the interpretations. They've done something interesting here. So in the blue at the top, they've not said interpretation one, they've actually said Height and Hinton, which is the name of the historians who wrote interpretation one. So an examiner reading it would know that this was about interpretation one. And further down, they've said interpretation two, which is highlighted in green, but then they've also called it the history learning site. They're still talking about the interpretation. We would always suggest that it's probably easier to just say interpretation one and interpretation two. But however you do it, what matters is that the examiner can tell which one you're talking about. And this student has done that, whether by using the label or the name of the historian, they've let the examiner know which one they're talking about. The other point is they've mentioned both interpretations. Remember, you have to use both interpretations. And so the examiner here can see, yes, they've used interpretation one and they've used interpretation two. 
So you pause the video, read this paragraph, and we'll talk about it in a moment. So again, we've got red for the analysis and evaluation, blue for the knowledge. And again, you can see there's more evaluation with a small amount of well-selected knowledge rather than lots of knowledge. They say, however, I agree more with Hyten Hinton's opinion. That's interpretation one. So they're now making a judgment that they think one of the views is better than the other. The writers state that the shortage of work has led to more women returning to work. So there's a little quote there. It's not a long quote. Sometimes short quotes are better. And they've supported their agreement with some knowledge. They talk about Hitler increasing the army. They've got some statistics. They mention the key phrase labor shortage and then how 2.4 million women who were housewives went into work in factories and industrial areas. They've selected key precise knowledge to support why they think that's the better viewpoint. And then they say, therefore, I disagree with interpretation too, as rearmament actually led to an increase in women working. So the key point to take here is that they're not just talking about what the interpretations say, they're focusing on making a judgment, how far they agree. And here they've made the decision that they think one of the interpretations, interpretation one, is better than interpretation two. And they've done it in a really clear and focused way. Having done that, it all needs to lead to a judgment. And here's the judgment which they have selected. They've started by saying in conclusion, which is a nice simple way of flagging it up, letting the examiner know that this is where the big judgment's going to be. Remember that the judgment should always focus on how far you agree with interpretation two. It should be supported. You can't just say you agree or disagree. You have to be able to justify your choice. And really, it should support the line of reasoning you've developed in your answer. We're not looking for a surprise judgment that doesn't match what you've said in the rest of your answer. This is one reason why many of the strong answers start with a plan which is something we've mentioned in other videos. So here they say, in conclusion, although I agree with the history learning site, remember that was interpretation two, that the Nazis attempted to make women submit to their policies, but they were not as successful as the writer suggests. I like that language there, yeah. suggests. Mm -hmm. I agree more with Height and Hinton, that was interpretation one, that the Nazis did not succeed in their oppression of women as the number of working women increased and many rebelled against the social norms which the Nazis endeavored to enforce. It's not a long judgment, but they've made a very clear uh, argument for why they agree more with one than the other. We've got example here just showing the sort of language that might be used. Take a look at the pink box. This is a weaker example. I agree with interpretation two because it has good information. It says that the women were not meant to work. The Nazis tried to make women be mothers. Well, the student has made a judgment here, but it's not really clear why interpretation two should be seen as better then the other interpretation, what does it mean it has good information? And just saying what it says, well, that doesn't prove that that's a good argument. Now compare it with our green example. I mainly agree with interpretation too, because it accurately describes the attitude of the Nazis to women working. For example, in how they wanted to women to leave work to be mothers. However, and we can imagine that this student probably went on to balance their judgment by offering an area where perhaps they didn't agree as much. So what's the difference? Well, this one has justified why they feel that interpretation two is a convincing explanation. And that can often be a sign of a stronger judgment. So that's the questions. Let's spend our last few moments in this video talking about some revision hints. Katie, perhaps you could explain these for us. Absolutely, thank you. Um, right, so we've talked at the end of each of our student walkthrough videos on different tips for how to revise for GCSE history.
And a common one that always pops up is the document that we call the specification. Now, this document, I've pulled out a section here in the top right for you. It identifies for you the key knowledge that you need to know for this paper. For paper three, this can be found online. And if you are struggling to get hold of it, then your teacher will be able to find it for you. We've also got documents on the Pearson website called topic booklets. And within them, they have key terms and phrases that you should be familiar with. We've looked previously at how some of those key terms and phrases might be used in exam questions. So it's really worth having a look at the topic booklet for your uh, unit option for paper three to make sure that you're familiar and you understand some of the language we would expect you to know. Similarly, on the Pearson website, there's also knowledge booster quizzes, which can be found for the Weimar and Nazi Germany paper as well. So how do you specifically revise for this topic? Well, it comes down to practice, 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 practice. There are lots of past exam papers that are available on the website. Your teacher will also have loads of past papers and questions for you to practice with. So do make sure you are asking them for help. It's the number one way, honestly, that you will make progress in history. You can know everything that there is to know about your topic, but unless you can apply it appropriately in the exam, you're not going to get the marks that you really deserve. In addition to past exam papers, you can also find different exam questions in your GCSE textbooks, and there are lots of revision sites that are available online. Another idea is getting your teacher or somebody that you practice revising with, whether that's a family member or a friend, to kind of give you a viewpoint to make a statement. So imagine it would be kind of like an interpretation. So, for example, this statement here, Hitler was a popular leader. The German people loved him. And what you would need to do then to help you revise is practice arguing either in support of that statement or against that statement. Another one could be the main reason Hitler came to power in January 1933 was because of the role of the SA. How far do you agree? Well, you might want to then practice arguing the importance of the role of the SA but then also practice arguing against that and some of the other factors that were arguably more important in helping him become chancellor. Also, when you're practicing using exam papers, try and do the question three in one straight kind of go. What you don't want to do is just always jump to question 3D, because as Ben rightly said in the video, those steps that 3A, 3B, 3C, that's all the preparation and the hard work in order to help you do question 3D. So try and do them all in one go. Another really useful way that you can revise for paper three is the good old fashioned timeline. As history teachers, we love timelines. So using your specification, picking out key events, developments or people and putting them into the correct chronological order. Also, maybe making sure that you can sort them by the key topics that Ben mentioned at the beginning of this video in section A to make sure that you know which knowledge goes into which question. You might then use this information to help you decide about the utility of sources. So if, for example, you know that and something else was going on around the date. So, for example, that women's source that we looked at 1938, if you know that that's at the height of kind of uh, Nazi censorship and control, then that could be something really useful to say around the provenance of a source. So really worth having that kind of overarching timeline um, to help you revise. This has been the final video as part of the student walkthroughs for GCSE history. We really hope that you found them useful and if there is any feedback, then do feel free to leave them in the comments. We would like, you, like to wish you the best of luck for your exams in the summer and good luck with your revision.